I'm Amy Blossom from Jackson County Library Services, and I welcome you to Windows in Time. Windows in Time is a series of local history talks, a program that's been developed by the Jackson County Library Services and Southern Oregon Historical Society. It is also part of the Southern Oregon History Show, which, shows, which airs on Thursday nights at 6 p.m. You can also see us live, though, at the Medford and Ashland Libraries, the first and second Wednesday of each month at noon. So are you ready for some history? Let's go! Hi, I'm Dennis Powers, uh, and my wife and I have lived in Ashton for 20 plus years. I retired, uh, oh, about six years ago after teaching at Southern Oregon University, teaching business law for some 15 years. I've written a number of books uh, in, uh, around this area, some 20 books in total, 15 uh, basically being nonfiction. Uh, and there's been a maritime series that has to do with uh, everything from the Crescent City tsunami that d devastated uh, that town and the West Coast in 1964 to treasure ship about sunken gold in a gold, a gold and ghost ship uh, to St. George Reef Lighthouse, the most dangerous, expensive uh, lighthouse built in this country, right off of uh, Crescent City and some other ones, working up uh, the types of programs that we'd have for the Windows and Time series, Susie Jessel's name came up. I knew a little bit about her, but not a lot, and I decided to look into it. I was astounded by what I found. The first uh, slide uh, is one of Susie Jessel. Uh, it also uh, goes into what was uh, talked about uh, in True Magazine uh, in February 1943. Susie came to Ashton in 1931. She was dirt poor. Uh, and she had six children, a cow, uh, a car. Her husband couldn't find work. So they really had to go ahead and start working from the beginning, and although she had been a healer and had been doing this that we'll be going into for, for some years. Uh, she was 40 at the time. Uh, she was unknown at the time. But in 12 years, she was able to build up this practice, and let me read this to you. In a small Oregon village in the foothills of the Siskiyou Mountains lives a country healer who has probably one of the strangest practices in the world. Uh, the article went into the fact that she treats almost as many patients uh, in a week as do many of the uh, large hospitals. Uh, and she also uh, was one that when she gets down to the business, she rolls up her sleeves and puts the crowd into a line and attends to them. From the article called, they call her Miracle Woman. Life began for, for Susie in 1891. Uh, she was born in a small log cabin in the hills of Murphy, North Carolina, on Hanging Dog Creek. Now, isn't that incredible? I mean, thinking about places where you've been or where you're born, Hanging Dog Creek. But no one suspected the fact that she was on the way because her mother at the time was 52 years old, had already eight children, was a grandmother. And she attributed her not feeling as well to the change of life. Uh, her mother, though, was a midwife and a country doctor, and her grandmother was actually a medical doctor. So there was a real tradition, if you will, that was coming here. Susie was born with a call or a membrane over her face. And in the local lore, that meant that she had a special gift. Uh, when her mother uh, was nursing afterwards and she noticed that she was tender, she also noticed that when her little infant went ahead and touched her, that the pain and fever seems to disappear from herself. One of the uh, earliest remembrances that Susie has is being carried through the cornfields at all hours of the night to the ailing, and before long, they would get some relief from the pain. Now, what's interesting here, and we'll be going more into this, is that there are some rare people who have a way of connecting. But Susie, throughout her whole life, connected not only spiritually with the people, but she also connected in terms of friends. I was really surprised when I got into this as to the friends that she made throughout the country. And so she had said that her healing career basically started before she was out of the cradle. You know, this was a hard life. 
uh, hoeing, working in the cornfields, uh, milking cows, working in the lumber camps. Uh, however, uh, to pass the time, you know, there is music uh, at, uh, you know, get-togethers and fairs. And one of the stories that came up was that Susie played the banjo. And so at one of the, the county fairs, uh, the band that's supposed to be there didn't show up. So Susie picked up, she was very talented, picked up a banjo and started playing. Well, some people began applauding. And she kept playing and people applauded more. And before you know, they were tossing some coins to her. So she thought this was wonderful. So she scooped up some of the coins and ran back to, uh, to her family, told her mother about it, and said, Mama, I think I found what I want to do with my life. Uh, and what, honey? And that, uh, that is to be an entertainer. Well, her mom said, not in your life. Those are very, very different people, and the life is not what one would expect of you. So she said uh, in her uh, biography, actually called Healing Hands, which is a very interesting book to get into, uh, you know, that uh, uh, her career as an entertainer stopped right then and there. What was interesting to me was that Susie wanted to be uh, treated like all other, let's say at this time, teenagers, and she didn't want to be treated differently. Uh, so when she uh, was 16 and the family uh, moved to eastern Tennessee, she earned a teaching certificate. But the problem with, with that was that in these, these one-room log cabins, uh, that they didn't pay much. So she then learned tailoring and how to be a seamstress. Uh, she wanted to be independent. One of the real big episodes in her life was why walking in the hills, Susie stopped by a spring of water and glanced down. And in there, she saw the shimmering hundreds of stars twinkling as if reflected from the sky. She had a, a vision of Jesus uh, with hands outstretched saying, go and heal the sick. But what was interesting is although her life was really dedicated to healing, to working with those who were ailing, to taking care of people who were ailing, that she still had a teenager's life to live, which really impressed upon me because she didn't just gravitate to it. She knew she was different, and yet she really wanted to have a normal life. So in eastern Tennessee, uh, in, a, a, in Teleco Plains, which is a company logging town, she started going around with several of the young men in the area. And interesting enough, on this, this slide, you'll see that, that she was an attractive lady, and she entered a beauty contest uh, to help dedicate a new church, and she won. Interesting enough was that although she was also earning a living and taking care of ill people, she also was dating and, and seeing some of the young men in town. She was actually engaged for two years, and this is kind of a cute story because what happened was she was treating the ailing father of a friend of hers. And so rather than going ahead and walking the 10 miles all the way back to her home, she decided to stay in a different bed in the bedroom of her friend's house. Well, then there were some interesting scratches on the window. And the window was, was brought up. A, a man stepped in, and she couldn't believe it. The voice was of her betrothed. The voice was of her fiancé. Well, that took care of that engagement. But she uh, did meet a deputy sheriff uh, when she was 21, a person by the name of Rob uh, Kelby, uh, had two daughters, actually, actually had a son and a daughter, and began married life. But it only lasted for three years because her husband was killed in the line of duty. So she found a job with an old Southern family, did tailoring the side, washed and ironed shirts, and was doing things besides uh, her healing. So she was continuing to, to do this. And the healing, again, was, was tending to, to those who were ill, talking compassionately with, me, with them, and then also going ahead and finding out where their ailments were. We'll be going more into that later when we go into, uh, into Ashland. She met Charlie Jessel, and that was the love of her life and the love of his life. They connected immediately. She was 28. Charlie was actually uh, 35, so he was seven years, uh, uh, years older. More children were born, uh, and they moved to Indiana, where they rented a farm. And from there, they went to South Dakota. And that was where their daughter Alma was born in 1926. By then, they had six children. Now, this was hard life. 
because with six children to raise, working the farms uh, and this hard life, Susie had little time to, to use her gift. And, and mind you, this was a time when you didn't have support assistance. There was no unemployment. There was no welfare, no food stamps, you know, no mobile telephones, none of these things, no rent assistance. You had to earn it. And if you didn't earn it, uh, then you were hungry. When they were in South Dakota, though, Interesting enough, uh, fate intervened because they put in crops uh, that year and it burned out. But as a little girl, Susie always loved the word organ. And when an old family friend invited them to come to the eastern Oregon town of Baker, uh, the family moved there. And so this was part of the ambiance that was happening. Because now we're in 1931. Uh, and, and Susie's 40 years old, a neighbor called to ask if she would go ahead and tend to her ailing father uh, who was in Grants Pass. Susie said, of course I will. I'll see what I, can, what I can do and what I can help. But different people then told her about a very beautiful little town in the Rogue Valley named Ashton. The main drawback was the fact that there was just no work or money uh, there. And to a certain extent, we have the same problem in terms of jobs in our town. Uh, but Susie liked her first view of the town, and the reason was, was that it had an outstanding educational opportunities where her children could go from first grade all the way through college. And that's where he had Southern Oregon State Normal School at the time, which is the predecessor of SOC and then SOU. And uh, that was really a main draw for her. At that time, the town had only 4,500 people. They first settled on Iowa Street, and their total possessions that I had mentioned was some furniture, six children, a car, and one cow. Charlie couldn't find work in the beginning, and he got the runaround at the WPA, being the Works Progress Administration. So Susie went ahead uh, and tried to find the person and got the same runaround. Uh, but she was able to find the man who made the decisions, who was a prosperous-looking man, uh, who uh, at that time was smoking a big cigar. So I'll read this to you from this biography. Uh, what happened was, is his first quest was, do you have a car? Susie said, yes. Uh, rent paid, yes. Any livestock, one cow. He looked up and said, well, you don't sound poor to me. Well, Susie went ahead and said, quote, this made me mad. And I told him that if we didn't get work, we couldn't run the car, pay the rent, or feed the, the cow, and the children go hungry. So he could do one of two things. Feed us or shoot us. And she walked out. Two days later, Charlie got the job digging ditches in Lithia Park uh, for the WPA program. Uh, they finally settled on a dirt road then uh, known as Holly. And you can see Holly Street today, of course, uh, in Idaho that's up above the university. And her healing practice started working and started growing. Now, here's an important thing. She didn't advertise. She didn't ask money for her services. And she told her patients that she was not a healer. This is really important. She said she was only a vehicle for God's work and that her ability, her ability was given to her by her creator. But one of the key things was that if a person said, can you cure me? And she'd say, no, I can't make that promise, but I can make you more comfortable. I was uh, doubting when I first was getting into about Susie Jessel, but I can tell you I'm a believer. She really is the real thing. Because more and more people came to her clinic as the word spread, and her overriding goal was to treat suffering humanity. She was as close to Mother Teresa, when we look at that, as anyone I've seen in this valley and in this region, and, and more than likely this state. Uh, with the slide that you see in terms of uh, inside the private room, you can see Susie asked the patients not to tell about their particular ailment. She would talk to them as a friend about where they came from, and tell, tell her about her family. As her hands went over their torso, and what would happen is, is that those that, that were there said later that her hands felt warm. Uh, and then, at times, the veins on the back of her arms and her hands would actually rise uh, over the afflicted area. 
And a treatment would be anywhere from one to three minutes. And a treatment would be where she would be going ahead and working over the area. Uh, and then she, what she would do is she would just tell them, not making a diagnosis about how many more times, if they wanted to, that they could probably come uh, and, and, and have some help. No forcing, uh, poking, or manipulation was done. I mean, I, I've been in the Philippines, and I saw the faith healers there, you know, where they're actually, they, they seem to be operating, they're pulling out part of a, a muscle or things like that, and the sleight of hand is something that is really incredible. She didn't do this. Um, the treatment was over when she walked over to a stand, wiped her hands with a towel, and her veins returned back to normal. With the Holly home that they then eventually bought, it was soon evident they needed a separate place because how do you have uh, where you're raising a family and having a family life trying to be normal? But on the other hand, what you're doing uh, is you have people coming now from all over Oregon and even other states. So they bought the adjoining lot in Idaho, which had an old house on it. And Charlie went ahead and remodeled it uh, into two uh, basically units where people could stay who were non-ambulatory in a treatment facility. Every single afternoon, Susie would come to the treatment center, and she would stay until the last patient was seen. That would be 16-hour days. Uh, her daughter, Alma, had said later that, that uh, she seemed to get her energy from her work, and it had to be that way. Then we had when True Magazine profiled her nationally in, in 1943, she was soon seeing upwards of 600 persons a week. And on the 600 persons a week, they would travel thousands of miles to see her. They came by plane, by train, by bus, by taxi, by car, all these different ways. And the plates in their cars were nearly all the types of states of the union. It was national, and they were coming to get help or relief from their pain from Susie. And, and the ailments were many. I mean, it could be severe colds. It could be the flu. It could be arthritis, severe rheumatoid arthritis, even cancer, broken bones. But you see, what happened, though, is that even doctors would refer their tough patients to Susie, and Susie referred back to them. So this is really a different type of, of, of deal that is very heartwarming when I look into it. Another national one was Time Magazine in 1953. And Time Magazine in 1953 went ahead and uh, wrote an article on her. And on this one, uh, what I have on this, this slide is that you can get kind of an idea of what it's like. Uh, that, that many wore bandages or held to canes and crutches. Some bore the grimace of, of chronic pain. These were people who were sick and something that she did all in all for 35 years. Uh, she would come in, and sometimes she had a white nurse's uniform uh, and a fancy print apron, and she would raise her arms to the picture of Christ and say, I dedicate my hands to the Lord. That was it. She did not care what a person's religion was. She didn't care uh, if they're aesthetic or agnostic, because she was there to do the healing. If they didn't pay her, that was fine. She actually returned large donations of money, as you could imagine, would be coming in there because she didn't want to change the way that she was relating, and not only relating to the individuals, but also to the community. I have to say also that it wasn't all life and, and, and wine and roses, because actually, during that time period, uh, you had an Ashland minister that actually called her and declared her as a heretic, and drummed her out of the church that she'd been in for 20 years. What she did is she found another church. And the other ministers and religious leaders in the area totally supported her. She got poison pen letters uh, that were very, very tough from people that not only doubted, but basically didn't like what she was doing. They even, a couple of them, turned in uh, uh, them, the Jessels, into the IRS uh, because of the fact that she was having cash. But this wasn't a lot of cash. These were dollar bills, for $5 bills and $10 bills. So what did Susie do? She hired a tax attorney, actually an attorney who was, who was dealing with that, and just the case was uh, settled for small amounts and then dismissed. The healing really was taking its toll, and you think about it. 
because she kept on treating humanity. Uh, she died in 1966, and the mourners thronged to Ashton Cemetery. There were many testimonials given. And I can, I can say that when I gave this presentation in Medford, I was struck by some of the testimonials, if you will, that came there, uh, and even when we gave it in Ashland. And, and one of the ones that really struck with me was a, a, a man that said that her, her fa his father actually went to see Susie and was ill and went for about six or seven times, but was having relief from his pain. And on that last visit, Susie just said, you can go home now. I can't help you anymore. He died a month later. I mean, this, this is really moving material. One of the things that really stood out to me also was that, uh, and it was very true, was that a, a patient's faith, age, color, or denomination had no effect whatsoever on God's healing, and so therefore it had no effect on Susie's uh, 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 healing. And her mother taught her about love, charity, and humility. And, and I'll read this is that somehow she managed to keep me from feeling too different from other children and adults as I grew up because we were taught that God gives each one of us a gift and we all use them together for a common purpose. Now that really strikes me because isn't it true? I mean, think about it. Every person, even those who are watching this or, or if, if you hear about this, we all have a special gift. There's something we do a little better than others, and to use it to help another person is really what it's about. Her son Joe uh, carried on with her work until he passed away in 1975. It's, it's true that Joe didn't have the, the close connection uh, with patients that Susie did, but then again, who could? And her daughter Alma then took over at age 49 in that year, and then again, they believed that it, it came from God, but we'll talk about that really at the end. And Alma then moved to Phoenix, Phoenix in uh, 1991. The three acres uh, of the surrounding property originally owned by the Jessel family became the Jessel subdivision in 1955. A trailer park now, you can see it, now occupies uh, the treatment room uh, and, and the land, uh, and that has been remodeled into a two-room unit. Uh, the actual Jessel House with the name on it is on, is on Holly near I Idaho with its sign. It was purchased by a very wonderful person uh, from the family in, in 1987, and it's being run uh, as a, a, a VRBO or vacation rental uh, by the owner. I took this picture, this last slide, in winter, and it just seemed to shine. Uh, with, with the, 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 uh, the golden rays of the setting sun. But I think, in conclusion, that we have the power of positive thinking and working together with a patient. She was bright, rural, her mom was a healer. And also think about this, there are electrical impulses that, that comprise our bodies. And there are those rare people who will be able to come into that, can sense it, to come into that. Edgar Cayce had past life regressions. Uh, and think about the special sensitivities that animals have. You know, they can hear. Uh, dogs can hear things we can't hear, smell things that we can't smell. Uh, and they can pick up these vibrations. She was not fervently religious. She wasn't saying heal or doing an Elmer Gantry approach. She didn't claim to cure all ills. She said no in terms of, can you cure me? She referred to doctors. She would suggest herbs. And the patient did not have to have faith to be treated by her. And think about now, uh, for example, uh, it's, it's throughout our area, uh, let's say in Ashland specifically, you have psychic healers, you have rexologists, rexologists, crystals, energy fields, past life therapists. I've seen working up close. I've seen acupuncturists, massage therapists, nutritionists, deep tissue massages. I've seen all this. And I really need to tell you that she is the real deal. And she stands out because of not only her compassion, but also the way that, that she just treated everyone the same as if they were her friend. 
I have to say it's been my real pleasure to be able to give this presentation, and I really want to thank you very much you know, for, for watching all of the Windows in Time series that are being done uh, in 2014. There we continue on in other years, of course. Uh, 2015, 2016 are being typed uh, live. So I just want to say thank you, and Susie Jessel is the real deal. So thank you for coming and joining us this evening. And open your eyes. Remember, history is everywhere.